good morning namaskara bengaluru and uh, i hope you guys made it on time here that's fantastic to have one session before us just so that everybody could come in so thank you very much for joining us and uh, we got the big stage for all of for ourselves prateek what do you think right so, <laughs> okay an let's interesting topic are there an interesting topic i think it really segues very well with what uh, we were uh, discussing in the previous uh, segment as well so it would be lovely to kind of do some interactive uh, session today it's just the two of us so we'll we'll probably have more time for q and a but the topic is primarily around white space and we'll we'll kind of uh, uh we'll have to create some elbow room there we'll talk about it but before that prateek do you want to talk about your experience your background and yourself sure thanks balam and good morning everyone uh i work in the b2b business of jio for last 4 years uh, prior to that i spent couple of decades with the tata group uh, in various businesses hospitality real estate airport airline investments uh, and telecom uh done uh, both on the b2c side and b2b uh, parts of the business so very excited to be here uh, this is a topic which is relevant for every company every industry and uh, it goes beyond just market opportunity and we'll talk about that uh, today but sure sounds good thank you prateek and uh, i am uh, bala grisabala i'm uh, the uh, managing director at vista consulting group which is an arm of uh, advisory arm of vista private equity and uh, i'm you know zinov is very close to my heart and i've seen zinov confluence uh, go from strength to strength so kudos to the entire team of zinov i think uh, you guys have outdone every year every year pari and team vamsi vijay i haven't seen vijay today morning but fantastic I'm so glad to be here it's kind of coming back home so with that we are talking about white spaces and the idea is everybody has a as a kind of a view of what a white space is it's all typically connotes a market opportunity but we given the diversity of the audience here we are going to be probably broadening that and create some white space within white space to kind of know what does white space even mean and we're going to be talking about it from three different angles of how you can probably expand reorient or redefine certain definitions around it to create opportunities in in different parts of our our business so with uh, the primarily let's just kick it off with uh, the very first thing that comes to our mind about when we talk about white space is is of a market opportunity so how do you define white space particularly in a very disruptive era which is very confusing your business is not just impacted by your competition but uh, not by your supply chain but it's also the geopolitical nature of it and technology and different other industries are all clubbing together it kind of feels like a gla gladiator a uh, you know fight going on there so in this kind of a very confusing um uh, very ill defined uh, structures around what our what an industry actually means how do you even define your opportunity and that's a, probably the first question that we should probably talk about and i'm very very honored to have prateek here because nobody else disrupts a, an industry as much as we know pratiks uh you know uh, geo does so let's ask pratik so how do you guys think about white space from a market perspective or from an industry perspective do you look at it top down do you look at it bottom up how do you guys how do you guys think about that so thanks um i i think it's uh, probably the most important uh, topic for any business uh in terms of looking at the next wave of growth and typically i've seen comp uh, the two three things that companies do wrong one incremental thinking two relying on sorry zinov but relying on data analyst reports about how, what's the state of the market today is you often make mistake if you see where the market is uh, today and i'll give you a example of how we went uh, uh, about uh, pursuing the geo business in 2015 if somebody had asked what is the data market or the internet market in the country uh, that would come to 2 billion dollars or 15000 crores of uh, revenue in a otherwise 200000 crore or 30 billion dollar telecom market so 
the industry pundits would say, oh, data is growing fast and it's growing at 30% year on year, and that's how we should be investing in. An investment for a 15,000 crore would be very different than investment for something else. What did we do? I think the first important aspect is what is the customer truly needing? And I saw the slide, customer need, talent need. I think the core question we have to answer is, what is the guy doing with that internet? Is he wanting internet? No, he's wanting to get himself educated, to get himself entertained, or whatever. And we saw an opportunity that in a country like India, uh, the entire 200,000 crores of voice could be converted to data. So we did not invest looking at a 10,000 or 15,000 crore data market that existed then. We invested in a 200,000 crore market which had the potential of becoming completely data. And you, know, you all know, today, voice is free. 250,000 crores of telecom is all data. So it's about looking, reimagining business and not truly relying on where the market opportunity exists today or the data that exists uh, today. That's, I think, the, one of the core aspects of looking at a business. It's, it's fantastic. So you are saying white space is not a pixel on a board, but you have to like wipe out the board and reimagine that, and that's, that presents different opportunities and different ideas. Is that, is that how you guys look at it? Absolutely. See, often the business opportunity exists because of a customer use or a use case. Uh, we try to siloize it by saying, oh, he spends 500 rupees on telecom, oh, he spends 30,000 rupees on uh, entertainment, he spends something on uh, uh, clothing. Uh, little do we realize that there are substitutable uh, experiences that uh, can make you move a bucket of goods from A to B bucket. Uh, we're not saying that the customer is going to open his purse more just because you have a product. But, and I'll give you an example of uh, how we're going about doing this. One would say that internet is only customers pay 500 rupees for internet. Why would customer pay 2,000 bucks or yep. more? But if you look at that a family of four in a metro city spends 2,000 rupees per movie outing, uh, parking and popcorn included. And if you were to say that if the family goes twice or thrice to a movie hall in a month, they're spending 6,000 bucks. Can I do a first day first show release on internet and get 400 rupees out of that? Yeah? Maybe he'll still go for a couple of uh, times to a movie hall, but he'll replace one of them with the uh, digital streaming experience. Absolutely. So you've, what you've done is shifted his spend from one bucket to the other. It's not that we are going to increase our revenues from 500 rupees to 1,000 by asking him to pay more. He's substituted. And I think substitution is one of the key aspects one needs to look at. And very often, the substitutable products are not in the industry that you define. So it's very important to see. And I think it, uh, it goes back to the same point. Do not look at data, do not look at what he's doing, but why he's doing it and what is the need that he's fulfilling. If you can fulfill the need, uh, you've got the business idea. I think that's a fantastic way of looking at it. Like, in most often, I think we get hung up with respect to our business models and our product lines and white space creation is more from the lens from which we look at, okay, I'm selling it for X number of customers, how can I increase it or sell more? Rather, you're saying you have to sit on the other side of the table and look at it from how customer views it and then reimagine what would the customer need and that, that's, that's your way of kind of creating that white space. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, give you an example beyond geo. Uh, see, nomenclature actually is the biggest or should I say dampener or a roadblock to innovation or identifying white space. It's very important to know what are you and what are you serving, who are you. If Titan continued to be a Titan watch company, it would not have created sunglasses. So at some point in time in their journey, they decided to drop that word watch because they redefined their business to be not a watch company, but a lifestyle company. So very often, if I say I'm only in this business and very narrowly define it, you miss the white space or the adjacent uh, businesses or opportunities that exist. So it's sometimes we ourselves create that narrow-minded uh, focus by, nom by creating those nomenclatures. So it's very important 
Shakespeare said, what's in a name? But I think it's very, very important. Everything is in a name. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, because absolutely. that's how you condition yourself. That's right. I, you are absolutely right. And particularly so, in my opinion, this, this redefinition is not just relating to new opportunity. It's actually a survival. Because right now, the industries are getting completely disrupted from left and right and everywhere. And there are so many forces with our, which are moving so quickly that you don't even know which industry you are in anymore, correct? Absolutely. So given that, if we do not think about it like that, like redefining ourselves more from, not only from how we look at our own business, um, it's not about creating white space and headroom. It is about even preserving your seat you are sitting on. So it's more disruptive than just a optionality. Is that right? No, absolutely. And I, I think uh, it's very important to continuously question, uh, grow, do the ground up thinking, the incremental thinking, and especially in businesses which have been existing, that tends to happen. Saying, oh, I, was, I grew 15% last year, so I'll go to 20% uh, this year. I think wiping the slate clean and reimagining, again, once again, going back to saying, what is the customer looking for? What can I uh, serve him with? I think this is the most important uh, question. No, and not just for uh, business, but also how do I operate? Is this the best way to serve the customer? Is this the best way to manage my employees? So I think uh, going back to basics, first principles, on every aspect of business, and doing it repeatedly, it's not an accident. You are not going to, st you may stumble you may onto stumble one. Upon, but it's more but deliberate. Right? Absolutely. So how do you, uh, Pratik, another question. A lot of the folks here have the uh, ability to kind of, create that conversation within their organization, but a lot of us also are limited by what, we, what our mandate is, right? So how do we think about it? Because many of these things that you talked about is a boardroom conversations, versus in our spheres, how do we redefine? How do we think about creating white spaces in, in what we manage? Let's say, particularly, many of the folks here are COE heads, right, site leaders, so they have certain a uh, certain leeway, but that restricts them to a certain uh, functions or certain capabilities. How do they think about white space within, the, within that sphere? So we heard about talent equal to customer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it uh, said talent equal to customer on the, on the, uh, the big title, but then it said more than customer exactly. on the subtitle. So uh, let's talk about talent. And uh, the white space exists in even talent identification or talent management. And I'll give you an example to bring this about. Uh, when COVID happened, our 6,000 people who were sitting in our call centers uh, went to their homes, right? So we had to uh, reimagine and create a, a distributed call center. But we did something more. And see, if our definition of our employee is nine to five, uh, eight hours, five days, then we are constrained by saying, where do I get the talent pool? Then you look at saying, uh, uh, what are the considerations? Oh, this is a guy who's 20 years old, 22 years old, and I'm taking a KPO, BPO example, fresh out of college, who wants to have a job, takes the job, but he moves at the slightest possible opportunity, increase in salary. And uh, by the way, uh, he's looking for somebody who's providing him a postgraduate degree, somebody's providing him a jump. And that's what the entire talent management and talent acquisition focuses on. Now, what did we do? Uh, we said there are set of, and I'm saying only women. We're saying there are women who are grads and postgrads who have worked for a few years but have taken a conscious call to be off work because they're bringing up the kids, but they have spare time. 11 to 4, when the kids have gone to school, they have spare time. And they're far more qualified than this 20, 22-year-old who's just looking for the next jump in. Uh, uh, we onboarded 20,000 women, completely digitally onboarded, uh, digitally trained on an app. And they do our retention calling. We have 450,000, uh, 450 million mobile base. They do retention calling. They paid completely basis success. And if I don't feel like working today, you don't have to log in. So there's no, it's a completely flexible time, flexible place of work, com business model which is only success-based, and, and retention is a lot better because they're not looking for the next jump. They want 
something meaningful to be done in that five hours. And we've onboarded only these, only women, 20,000 women, on a complete flexi everything. And that's reimagining talent. Because if you're going to get constrained by saying, I need a full employment, the guy has to come there, he has to come every day, he has to mark attendance, or uh, then you will get a certain talent pool. You're leaving behind a huge talent pool like this. Yeah, absolutely, so. absolutely. And it's just fa fantastic how you can actually reimagine that, and you can, that pool is really long. I mean, it's endless, right? So I think you've just reimagined this in a different way, and it's opened up your capacity to do that. No, uh, absolutely, and uh, we talked of operations or talent. There's also another uh, classic case of reimagining and creating uh, opportunities. So, as you know, India is a prepaid country, right? 98% of the subscribers are prepaid. Maybe only 2% of the subscriber customers here are prepaid, but the world outside is uh, all prepaid base. And a lot of them recharge twice or thrice a month. 50 rupees recharge, 40 rupees recharge. And where were they recharging before COVID? They were going to a Kirana store. When the Kirana stores shut, technically, potentially, we had zero revenue from next month, right? Because where would the, if the customer doesn't recharge, how does he get? Again, we onboarded a million, a million digital entrepreneurs or partners. You are a digitally savvy guy in your neighborhood, uncle, auntie, friend. You are recharging for them and making a small margin out margin. of that. Completely onboarded. Out of your home. And you Out of do your it home. Anytime. But yeah. you're taking care of those people who do not, who are not savvy to recharge online. Yeah. You're helping. You are the channel partner of the Kirana store for them. Got it. And you're doing it for 20, 25 people. You're making money also. Overnight, without a blip in revenue, we moved from a complete brick and mortar, Kirana store, general store way of recharging to uh, recharging through this 1 million digital entrepreneurs who we've not seen, not okay. met. So, I think it's important uh, to continuously see, and uh, I think the core of all of this is keeping your mind open. And it's, it's very difficult. You have to continuously condition yourself, saying, no, you cannot take this particular thing as given. Right. We often put constraints by saying, oh, this is done, this is done. Can I find a solution within that? Sometimes you have to break those uh, assumptions, assumptions or break those uh, things that you take as given. Fantastic, Pratik. Fantastic stories and absolutely uh, great uh, examples, real examples of how you guys have reimagined re uh, the, the whole. I'm 100% sure many of our colleagues on the, in, the, in the audience have done this. So if there is anything, I would love to hear some, some um, you know, examples from your own personal lives, and I'm sure many of them do it. Otherwise, I'm going to pick on some of my friends here. Anybody who wants to talk, just put, no, put your hand up and we can get the microphone to you guys. No? Okay, time that I will pick. Oh, I don't see. I don't see my friends here. Okay. Pari, you know, you know, you have more examples than anybody else here. Do you want to, do you want to give some example of how reimagining happened in any, any of uh, your customers? I thought I'll pick on Sanket, but I don't see him here. Maybe he's preparing for his session, which is Coming up next. Bala, you were not here. Yesterday, I gave all the examples. You gave all the examples? Okay. okay. You but put, but you I think that the way our team uh, moved to a hybrid or a purely virtual event for Confluence, uh, they did this scale in 2020 completely online and, and did that in a, in a matter of weeks, very similar to Pratik's example. Fantastic. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think. This drives back the home that uh, in the past three years, all our lives have changed multiple times over, given, you know, starting with COVID, then you, are, you would not have imagined that in 2020, you, 2022, you would actually be having physical military conflict, but it's still going on, and every, everybody said it'll be over in three weeks, but it's still going on more than three months, and they are now saying three years. So we are definitely living in a very disruptive world, a lot of it we don't control, but there are aspects that we need to kind of reimagine ourselves to kind of put ourselves in a, in a more controllable position. So I think those are some of the examples that we have seen 
where industries are getting redefined. You are no longer, every two years, you're no longer in, a, in the industry that you have defined yourself to be in two years before. So this is one area that we need to kind of reimagine. The second part that um, Pratik talk, talked about, which is fantastic, is to kind of, you got to, it's all in the name. You got to redefine uh, the, your, uh, yourself with respect to how you define yourself, and that redefinition also opens up opportunity. And the third one that Pratik talked about, which is also fantastic, is it's not just in the, you know, at the business level, but even in how you deliver value to your customer can be reimagined. You spoke about, you know, onboarding 30,000 women uh, and, 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 you know, kind of managing the talent situation. And all of us in this room, I think if there is one uh, pain point that we would uh, want to disappear is the talent situation that we all of us uh, face. So I think we are all reimagining from that perspective. So I um, thank you, Pratik. We'll sh should we take some? We got five minutes. We'll take some questions. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I see someone here. Hi, Pratik. So how did you reach that 20,000 women, you know, in just a week or so? How, uh, how did you reach those 20,000 women? So uh, while we uh, onboarded them digitally, uh, I think word of mouth, one, two, using the state machinery. So we obviously have a huge state machinery. We kind of seeded it, uh, onboarded few, uh, nat Slowly the word grew that, you know, there is an alternate form of employment at your uh, flexibility and that's how we were able to go on board. But it, it was a combination of uh, seeding through our physical infrastructure first uh, and then uh, automatically the, it just grew from there uh, because uh, people talked about or women talked about uh, uh, getting into the, doing this and uh, they were themselves able to onboard a few more of their friends and uh, uh, ex-colleagues. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, there's one uh, lady there. We'll come to you, madam. My, my question is, you know, I work, um, I manage a lab, so we have to physically work inside a lab, you know, and that is something uh, difficult to do online. Of course, some of the meetings we take online, uh, if, if you are stuck in those kind of situations where you need people to be inside your office, inside your labs, uh, how you would reimagine, you know, if there are some best practices you have heard from your colleagues, friends, that would be good to he uh, hear from you. So we can reimagine it together. We can use that and take the, to figure it out. But I think the important thing is not getting to the solution, but the process of uh, uh, doing it. Are you flexible uh, in a in your mindset, and that's, I think, is the most important thing, right? We've, because uh, we've always defined 40 hours working week. Uh, that puts a huge constraint, and be it a physical or virtual. So are there flexible employment models? Uh, and I think there is enough talent out there which is not in the workforce because we have defined it as 40 hours work week. So, uh, the question is, and I understand that you need people to come to the lab. I am sure there are a vast majority of talented people, skilled people, who are not coming because of this 40 hours. Can you, are you okay with two days a week? Are you okay with four hours? Maybe uh, it will open up. And I think it is important for us to keep thinking this because otherwise we are only attracting a particular set of people. Thank you. This, uh, before that, there's one lady here. Excuse me. And then we'll come to you, sir. There. Yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to share this example more from the perspective of how this white space in digital cash mechanism has changed the world. I don't see people expecting cash anymore. They're happy with GPay. Very true, very true. I think this is a very uh, undersold story of digital transformation in India, which has happened very silently. And I think there will be case studies and books, I mean, obviously are being written, 
but uh, I think the, its second order, third order effects are still yet to be, you know, realized. But it will definitely change and transform the country. Yeah. There's one gentleman there. Uh, Madam, can we get to you after that? He uh, was, uh, his hand was up before. Thank you. Prashant, I'm Pratik from ServiceNow. I want to understand specifically on the white space perspective, when you try to enter new market, right, which is white space, so what are the challenges you see from a leadership perspective? Because in that white space, you would have some of the other player uh, in that market, right? So from a leadership perspective, how do you see that, you know, how to build that business, you know, how to take it scale? So just want to get your perspective because Geo kind of entered into multiple white spaces, right? So how do you envision and how do you uh, look for that, how to build that piece of business? Yeah. So I think the core aspect of that uh, is, what we've all learned in business schools in marketing, Philip Kotler's book, right, of the four P's of marketing. And I think uh, it boils down to going to the basic of saying what customer need uh, uh, exists. It manifests itself in various forms, but the core need. I think if we build an organization, and mind you, I gave you successful examples. That doesn't mean that we have not tried something and failed. It's also important to Try out many things, you fail fast, fail small, uh, but uh, it is a continuous effort to s look at only from a lens, from a, when you're talking of market, only from a customer lens of what is he doing. Uh, and uh, I'll give one s small example. Uh, there are the gig workers, there are a lot of them in the country, right, who get maybe 500 rupees per day. Pay, and the, what is the, that person's job? To collect money from the uh, 15 customers, uh, and that's what his job is. So the customer, the company pays 500 rupees to that collection agent, but has no clue where he's been the whole day. And we created a small app which tracked where he was, he checked into this customer, checked out in 20 minutes, we could track him. And we said, company, to manage that 500 rupee resource, pay two rupees, 500 rupees per day, pay two rupees per day on this app. Yeah? And it looks logical saying, okay, I get to manage this 500 rupees, get uh, resource uh, more efficiently. So it's continuously about saying that spend does not exist. So if you were to look at saying, is that company spending two rupees on a digital spend? And you'll say, no, he's not spending. So that is the capacity that he has. But if you go to the company with a proposition that you'll be able to manage your 500 rupees better, he will take out that two rupees per day to say, okay, I will get to manage my resource better. So often the data or the undercurrent data of digital spends, this two rupees will not figure anywhere. But the efficiency that you can drive can make customers spend digitally. And I think that's the core aspect. If you're solving a customer problem, you, are, you will get money. That money may not exist today in the form that you think it is. It will not be in any uh, analyst uh, research report of a digital spend of the company. So I think it's continuously asking, what is that company trying to solve for? What is his core or her core objective? Absolutely. The time's up, so sorry about that. We can't take any more questions. Let's just sum it up. The that this is a very confusing times. We all have understood that. Very disruptive times. This is also the time to be much bolder. It is not the time to be incremental in our thinking. It is also the time to completely abandon our existing assumptions and definitions and where we are, what we mean, and et cetera, and all that, and keep going back to first principles, which is always, you can never go wrong if you're close to the customer and really listen to both the unmet needs and unarticulated needs of your customer, you can never go wrong. That's the only gospel that you have to hang on to and think really, really bold because it really requires you to not think based on where you are right now. It is almost same as like zero-based budgeting. You gotta go back to zero, start from first principles and then build it from there. So that's the key takeaway from the session. I can't believe that I would I'd be quoting this because it's one of the most quoted and maybe a little too much quoted, um, uh, you know, statement from Dickens, which is what? 
it is the best of the times and it's the worst of the times and i think it is the best of the times and it's in your hands to make it the best of the times thank you very much thanks thank prateek you. fantastic conversation thank you and before i go just one line uh, that i would want everyone to uh, take away from it you know this mandala painting drawing right this buddhist monks who do a very very intricate drawing and after doing that they don't preserve it they wipe it and they again do it next day if we can do the mandala drawing in our business model every day reimagine rethink start from scratch i think we will find enough and more white space in all aspects of our operation lovely lovely thank you very much thank, thank you. you so thank you prateek and bala